My name's Eric McBay. I'm a writer and activist from Canada, or, or rather, I come from a part of the continent that belonged to the Algonquin and the Mohawk, and that's occupied by the state of Canada. First of all, uh, I'd like to say that it's an honor that you had us speak here in Oakland, a place with such an amazing and strong tradition of political resistance. I've often been inspired, moved, and educated by the stories of resistance that have come from this place over many decades. Um, so I'd like to share with you a story of resistance. And it takes place here in this country. Um, in this story, an economic downturn has left millions homeless, hungry, and uncertain. After a costly war overseas, millions of veterans are in the same situation, virtually abandoned by the government they serve. In response, People set up in cities across the country. They set up camps, tent cities, and shanty towns in protest. And I'm sure that this sounds very familiar to you. But the story that I'm talking about took place 80 years ago. Uh, the Occupy movement isn't the first time in American history that mass encampments have been set up in cities. In the early 1930s, at the dawn of the Great Depression, hundreds of these camps were set up across America. They were named Hoovervilles after President Herbert Hoover was blamed for the Depression. And the biggest of these encampments was in Washington, D.C., where tens of thousands of World War I vets moved in, demanding a veteran's bonus that the government had promised but refused to give out. They called themselves the Bonus Army. Uh, by the middle of 1932, close to 20,000 people, both veterans and their families, had set up tents in makeshift cities. It was a way uh, of life. A, wa a baby was even born in the camp in Washington. And their only demand was that they wanted what the government had said they would give, that each veteran would get a dollar for every day they spent overseas. So after several months, the president decided that the camp had to go. He sent in the police who shot two of the protesters, but the veterans refused to leave. So the president sent in the army. A task force was led by George Patton and by Dwight Eisenhower, who later became the president. So when the army first arrived, the veterans cheered because they thought that their brothers in arms had come to march in support of the veterans. But instead, the army fixed bayonets on their rifles, put on gas masks, and charged the crowd. They used bullets, bayonets, and gas canisters to drive the crowd out. Many of the veterans were injured. A little boy was bayoneted, and that baby who was born in the camp was killed by the army's gas. They drove out the veterans and burned the camp to the ground. Of course, many of the Hoovervilles were attacked. The Hooverville in Seattle was burned down twice by the police, and they rebuilt it each time. That camp lasted 10 years. The veterans of the Bonus Army didn't give up, but I'll come back to them in a minute. So, I study and write about resistance movements. And for a resistance movement to try to gain and occupy ground over a long period of time is an extremely difficult thing to do. Many movements in history have tried to do this before they're ready and failed. And often it's not till they're very well established that they can actually relieve, re um, resist well-organized well police or soldiers and defend the territory they claim. That's why so many radical movements in the Depression went on the offensive and used direct action and disruptive tactics. They don't just sit and wait for the police to attack at a time that's convenient for the cops. They use their own mobility, initiative, and surprise to put those in power off balance. So at the same time as many in the Depression used the defensive tactics of the Hoovervilles, they used offensive tactics as well. When someone was evicted because they couldn't pay their rent, a team of people would go and install them back into their apartment. There were special gas and electric squads who were reorganized to re-hook up the, electri to the electricity and gas to people whose utilities had been disconnected. And if the government wasn't giving a family the relief services they need, then people would go down and they would occupy the relief office until they got what they needed. In Atlanta, around the same time as the people in the Washington Hooverville were being kicked out, 23,000 families were taken off the relief rolls because the government said there wasn't enough money. So a thousand unemployed people converged on the courthouse and made them find the funds. <coughs> These tactics were very successful. And the book Poor People's Movement argues that because poor people have little political leverage, they can only succeed through disruption of the system outside of the electoral politics and outside of government bureaucracy. They win by going on the offensive, and they lose when they're co-opted by those in power, when they're convinced to stop causing so much trouble and just go along with the system. 
the Occupy movement has been very resistant to co-optation, so you've been avoiding that one major trap, that movements, uh, that those in power use to neutralize social movements. But remember that movements only win when they can mobilize around concrete short-term goals. That's what gives people practice in resistance, it's what gives them, it what keeps the momentum up, uh, and it's what rallies new people to movement. You here in Oakland have already made great progress in this direction with the blockade of the port and the general strike. So if anyone can do this, it's you folks here. Let's get back to the bonus army and the veterans of the Great Depression. Four years after the camp in Washington was burned, the government finally gave in and paid the veterans their bonus. So why did they do this? One reason, of course, was that those who organized the Bonus Army and the Hoovervilles never gave up. Even when they were attacked and evicted, they regrouped, and they fought back, and they tried new things. The other reason was that during the Great Depression, the federal government was increasingly terrified of a revolution. When you have people storming welfare offices and reconnecting their own utilities, and rallying in marches of tens of thousands, it starts to look like a revolution might be imminent. So the government realized that the only way to head it off was to make concessions. People got concessions because the government was afraid of them, and because they never gave up. So the Hoovervilles were slowly removed as World War II began, as the economy began to, uh, to grow again, and as programs were put into place to abolish them. It's not going to happen the same way this time. The economy is never going to recover and grow the way it did in World War II. Capitalism is a pyramid scheme, it's a Ponzi scheme. It can only function when it grows, when it continually expands its circle of exploitation. The problem is not a glitch in capitalism, the problem is capitalism itself. And industrial capitalism is reaching the limits of its expansion. Global oil production has peaked. The energy supply will only become tighter and more expensive. The recent economic downturn, many economists believe, is just the first sign of peak oil. But once it truly sets in, the increasing cost and decreasing supply of energy will stall industrial manufacturing and transportation on a global scale. Global capitalism will wither. But this won't happen fast enough to stop global warming on its own. And the first effects of global warming, the worst effects, won't happen until decades after the oil is already gone. There's a lag effect, but once it happens, it's self-perpetuating. The ice caps will melt and release huge amounts of frozen greenhouse gases. The oceans, already emptied out by industrial fishing, will turn acidic and die. And the Amazon rainforest, which currently produces its own climate through transpiring moisture, will turn into a desert. According to a report, from the International Energy Agency this week, we only have about five years to prevent irreversible runaway global warming. This is the conservative International Energy Agency. <coughs> and we have to stop runaway global warming by whatever means we can, whatever means we can muster. If we can't, ecological collapse will wipe out all our other social gains and wipe out any future worth living in. Now we cannot stop this, but only if we have a real resistance movement. What we need is two prongs. On one hand, we need to build local, sustainable, democratic communities in which everyone's basic needs are met. Because when the real crash comes, we won't be able to rely on special squads to hook people's gas back up, because there won't be enough gas. We have to learn how to meet our own needs. And on the other hand, we have to fight to stop global industrial capitalism. We can only win if we shut down the machine. That's the only way to ensure a livable future. So we, what we need is a real resistance movement. And in addition to your movement, there's a movement right now organizing around these ideas called Deep Green Resistance. And there are people today here from that movement handing out flyers, including one called Occupy the Machine, which is a plan to occupy the actual physical infrastructure, to shut down the infrastructure that's destroying the planet and that's enriching, uh, the, the, enriching the 1% at the expense of everyone else. Turn down the internal movement, not the physical external movement. Then we talk and we So the plan in Occupy the Machine is one of the, is one of the first steps in a broader strategy to save the planet. Tomorrow there will be an event called Earth at Risk in Berkeley. 
seven people, including ourselves, Aaron Darty Roy, Thomas Lindsay, and Stephanie McMillan, will talk about how to build a resistance movement that can save the planet. It starts tomorrow at 10 a.m. at Wheeler Hall at UC Berkeley, and you can find out more by visiting earthatrisk.net. I hope that you'll join us tomorrow in Berkeley, and I hope that your General Assembly will consider endorsing the statement in Occupy the Machine, and that you here in Oakland will continue to be leaders in the struggle for justice and freedom, because we'll only win if we fight together for a future in the planet. Thank you.